I would like to welcome all uh, to this distinguished guest, guest lecture series organized by the anti Force India Foundation. Today is going to be the second lecture in the series and the main lecture was delivered by Professor Joe Venture Prince. Today, Professor V. K. Shivastan has very kindly agreed to deliver the lecture on relevance of anthropology in contemporary world, despite his busy schedule. Professor Shivastan is the head of the anthropology department at the University of Delhi. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Arun B. Bali, former director of ICSSR, who has also kindly agreed to chair this session. Also, a very warm welcome to the faculty from JNU as well as the other universities and to all those present here. I now invite Dr. Sumita Reddy to please introduce the lecture series as well as the speaker for today. Good evening, a very warm welcome. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to announce that today is the third anniversary of Anthropos India Foundation. A small group of anthropologists and social scientists started this foundation with few specific objectives in mind. As part of these initiatives, there are three areas which were identified for Anthropos India Foundation. One, to inculcate anthropological research methods used by many social scientists and social science disciplines through research methods courses. Secondly, to carry on with applied and action research. And third, a test lecture series by immune scholars. Uh, Maiden lecture was given by Professor Joan Nature from USC. And today is second in series, and we are fortunate to have Professor Shivastava with us to give a second lecture. Uh, as you all know, anthropology is a discipline with a long history and one of the vibrant subjects. However, there are not many departments of anthropology in universities and colleges. It is not taught at undergraduate level except for few departments. Anthropos India Foundation has wider scope to provide a platform to share, debate and publish research findings in these areas and strive for an enhancement, vibrancy and application of anthropological methods and theories in Indian context, focusing on applied and visual anthropology. Uh, I would like to now introduce our guest speakers here. Professor Vinay Kumar Shivasa is currently head and professor at the Department of Anthropology, Delhi University. He did his undergraduation from Hansras College, did MA Sociology from Department of Sociology in School, Delhi University, and PhD from University of Cambridge. Since 1976, he has been teaching in Delhi University, and he also he was also former principal of Hindu College for three years. His academic contributions are immense. His scholarly writings in both national and international peer review journals have guided students on the subject for a long time. He has written many books and monographs. His research interests have been on various issues. Currently, his work is on anthropological theory and method and comparative religion. Once again, I welcome you, sir. Now, I would like to introduce our chair, Professor Arundhati Bhatti, who has kindly agreed to come and share his views. He holds a master's degree and MBIT and PhD in sociology from the Department of Sociology. School, University of Delhi. Professor Arun Bali is the former director of Indian Council for Social Science Research, ICSSR. After a long career with ICSSR, he continued to be an advisor to chairman, ICSSR, and member secretary, and matters relating to research institutes and regional centers and organization matters relating to the ICSSR, preparing a draft of the Act for ICSSR for further consideration. Post retirement, he was a visiting professor at Karnataka University, Narawa, also a visiting faculty at the Sushant School of Art and Architecture, Gurgaon. He taught sociology of architecture, took classes and courses on built environment and spatial cultures and psychology of architecture. His areas of work have been on sociology of health and sociology of aging. He has been advising postgraduate and research students on matters related to formulating and designing research proposals. 
He has many fellowships and awards to his credit. The list is endless for both of our guest speakers here. We are fortunate to have them here on this platform to share their thoughts. And I would like to also introduce the website, the Hindley website. The information is given in the leaflets uh, kept outside and will be circulated. This website is a platform for all anthropologists and social scientists doing empirical research in India and abroad to disseminate their research, both basic and applied, with wider audience on various issues in the form of images, videos, articles, research papers. Sharing your work is just a click away. Register can be one way register free of cost by clicking the website link and you can upload your original work. Your authorship and credits will be maintained on the website and we look forward to your valuable contribution in making anthropology vibrant in India. Now I would like to invite Dr. Arun Bali to chair this session. Department of Anthropology. 
your university has a department of sociology where there are anthropologists. But whether those anthropologists truly represent the concerns of anthropology is another question. Whether they are pursuing what one understands by, by anthropology. Having been in the discipline for now more than 40 years or so, and, uh, and spending almost a lifetime, lifetime in it, sometimes I ask myself, what after all is this discipline? What is, what is anthropology and how anthropology has been shaping itself? My first submission is that anthropology is a group of subjects. One can say it is some kind of a, of a community of subjects, ecology of subjects. You can use all these terms almost interchangeably. Having a large number of areas. And in fact, if as an insider I look at it, I find that anthropology is highly inclusive. It has been has been like a big python. It has been engulfing disciplines after after discipline. Someone said in a private conversation, anthropology is very infectious, it is very contagious. And I should develop this point a little, little later. You have the study of biological aspects in anthropology, and you also have the study of social and cultural aspects in anthropology. And in fact, one of the concepts which is repeated, rather which is oft repeated is that anthropology is a bridge on one hand are the biological sciences, on the other hand are the social and cultural sciences, and this actually gives some kind of a distinctiveness to anthropology. A very eminent anthropologist whose name is known to everyone, Claude Levi Strauss, he said it is an interstitial science, meaning thereby it is a discipline which enjoys the best of all. And in fact, one of the arguments, and I'm a great supporter of that argument, is that anthropology can neither be placed in the faculty of science, where it is in Delhi University, the university where I work, it cannot be placed in the, in the faculty of arts, it cannot be placed in the faculty of humanities or social sciences, because if it is placed in social sciences, the biological sciences would be angry with us, and if it is placed in the faculty of science, the social anthropology will not be happy with it. And therefore, one of the most potent arguments has been that there should be a separate faculty for anthropology, which may be called faculty of anthropological sciences. The nearest example which comes to my mind is the example of the University of Cambridge, where I read for my doctoral degree, where there's a faculty of anthropology, and the faculty of anthropology comprises three departments, one on biological anthropology, the other on social anthropology, and the third, which deals with archaeology, the three main, main branches. And therefore, therefore, it is a fraternity of subject. And when we speak of anthropology, we have to be very clear that whether we are speaking like a physical anthropologist, or like a social anthropologist, or like an archaeologist, or like the fourth branch of anthropology, which is not highly developed in in, in our country, which is called linguistic anthropology. This fourfold conception of anthropology is one which was conceptualized by the founder of American anthropology, a man called Franz Boas, and one which has been adopted by American Anthropological Association. And it is here, anthropology is regarded as the holistic study, dealing with a comparative study of languages, dealing with a comparative study of biological system, dealing with a comparative study of social culture system, dealing with the past culture, the unwritten cultures, the cultures which have perished, and the relationship between them. I shall speak to you as a social anthropologist. Number two. Our second submission. When any one of us joins anthropology, the first thing 
which we are told even now and I remember when I attended my first class in 1969 it was the same thing which was told was anthropology is the study of man in time and space now we do not use the word man we use the word human beings now we say anthropology is the study of human beings in time and, and space giving an idea that we are concerned with the, all humanities we are concerned with all types of people we are concerned with all types of societies on this inhabited earth wherever they are we study them it's a very famous statement which is known to all students of anthropology from Clyde Clacoon who wrote a memorable book called Mirror for Men where he says anthropologists are interested in human beings wherever and whenever they find them wherever they see human being they are interested interested in it so a notion which is all encompassing a notion which includes the entire humankind but then the second thing and i am introducing this idea once again because many of you might not have visited the departments of anthropology and many of many of you might not be knowing what goes on in these departments any visit to any department of anthropology will impress you with four things you go to any department well as dr reddy pointed out that anthropology is not taught in many of the universities in this country if you allow me to count then i would say it is not more than 40 universities in this country where anthropology exists but anthropology is also taught under other nomenclature for example a department of tribal study will also have anthropology a department dealing with indigenous knowledge and indigenous culture the study of indigenous knowledge and indigenous culture will also have anthropology so would a department of tribal development these departments have also come up and they are they are the places where anthropologists work but remember there the anthropologists have to interact with folklorists they have to interact with linguists they have to interact with political scientists and historians who have been working on tribal societies they have also to interact with planners those those who have been planning for the tribals and after retirement they have joined the departments of of anthropology or departments of tribal development so you have you have in in total not more than 40 departments and these departments are of diverse nature and also of diverse facilities there are departments of anthropology which have only a couple of faculty members and there are departments of anthropology like my department which have 25 faculty members we have 25 people in in delhi university and almost more than 200 students and anthropology has become immensely popular it was a very popular subject especially when it was regarded as a good option for civil services examination but there are other reasons why anthropology has become become quite quite popular so when you come to anthropology department you would find that number one these are the four things and these are the dietetical diagnostic features of anthropology department number one you would find every anthropology department having museums and generally these museums are divided into two number one the museum which is usually called ethnographic museum and the other museum which deals with the biological aspect the biological specimen in the latter you would find a uh, uh, you know a stuffed uh, model of uh, gorilla or chimpanzee or apes and uh, various uh, various casts of fossil human beings and the other is the ethnographic one and in the ethnographic museum you will find that uh, that there are are material exhibits from the so called <coughs> undercoat so called primitive societies societies which at one time were called primitive 
the word has almost been given up because it was regarded as pejorative, as derogatory, and now new words have come to replace it. However, the word primitive is still continued in a sense which I will share take up, take up later. You find this is about communities which are which are you know inhabiting different parts of the world, communities which have two characteristics in common. Number one, they are pre-literate. They do not have the tradition of reading and writing. And number two, they do not have much mechanization. They do not have a very high, highly developed, sophisticated technology. And these people were generally called simple societies. So you'll find more exhibits of these. In fact, in the rooms in our classroom, you would come across pictures of such communities from different parts of the world. Second thing, you would find in every anthropology department, you'll find, find a conglomeration of courses which apparently seem to be unrelated. Number one, you will find a course on peasant movements. You will also find a course on human cytogenetics. You will find a course on industrial civilization. You will also find a, a, a course on speech ethnography. You will find a variety of courses in the same discipline. And one often wonders and asks oneself, think why these different courses are there? What is the relationship between, between them? You come to my department and I'll show you there are people who are working on, on DNA extraction and there are people who are working on physiological measure and there are people who are digging different sites in Andhra Pradesh. There are people who are working on comparative religion, different kinds of people who are there. Number three, the third thing you find in every anthropology department is what has become the hallmark of anthropology? Field work. That the course includes right from the very beginning, right from first year course, it includes what is called field visit. We go to zoological garden in case we are doing a course on primates. We go to villages to study. And in fact, both in third year, BA honors, BSc honors, and also in MSc final, we have to write dissertation based on first-hand field work. Every anthropology student, right from the beginning, is advised to do field work and should be prepared to carry out carry out field work. In fact, one of the oft-quoted statements you can you can ask the anthropologists in this room and they will tell you. Oft-quoted statement is 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 library work is for rainy days or lame ducks. This statement comes from I am Lewis. The book is called Social Anthropology. That you go to library to do your work, either when it is raining and you can't go out to do your field work, or when you can't really physically you can't you can't can't do it, then you opt for library work. We regard field work as central to our our learning. And there are books with the title Learning from the Field. This is a very famous book written by William White that you learn from the field. The field teaches you. Often, you know, the anthropologists are surprised. Surprised when someone comes and says, well, I have to prepare the research design in which I must give a battery of hypotheses, in which I should, I should point out the entire thing. And the anthropology students are rather puzzled. We don't do such a thing. In fact, in social anthropology, the discipline which I represent is that you are expected to choose whether you are working for your, for your MP dissertation or you are working for PhD dissertation, you are expected to choose the physical location where you would carry out your fieldwork. And number two, you are expected to choose broadly the topic on which you will be working, whether it will be economy or it will be 
inequality or it will be religion, it will be kinship or education or whatever. And then you start your fieldwork. We are told in our classes that your approach should be what is called funnel down approach. And there is a story in our discipline and these stories are often narrated, narrated uh, very fondly. There are stories where where a very, very prominent anthropologist who later on became a very prominent anthropologist or rather a new fight of anthropology goes to his supervisor and says, well, I have chosen my, my place where I am going to do my, my field work. What should I do? And the supervisor will advise, advise the anthropologist to carry a stonographer's notebook or a pencil. This is a, this is a, this is a true story about George Foster, who is one of the leading applied anthropologists, he went to his supervisor A. L. Kroeber and asked him, well, I'm going for my field work, what should I do? He said, you carry a stenographer's notebook and a pencil, that's all. The field will teach you. You will chance upon the topics of research when you are doing your field work. And the last thing which is about anthropology is, and something which is not very good, something on which I would be dwelling towards the end of my, my, my presentation, is, is something which will really impress you when you come to an anthropology department, not in a positive way, rather in a less positive way. I am not using the word negative here, less positive way, you would find that these anthropologists generally do not interact with the outside world. To use two expressions here, and I am telling you this as an insider, you won't find many anthropologists who would come and deliver lecture the way I am doing it. I know that you are from other disciplines and I come from a different discipline. You find in a less positive way anthropologists being inward gazers. Anthropologists being, I have written on it, cocooned, happy in their own words, happy in their own, if you allow me to use this metaphor, in their own ivory towers and interacting less with the outside world with the result that you find less presence of anthropology in the public life. We do not find many anthropologists contributing to public life or to public debates. Now we will ask here, furthering the fourth point we will ask here, is it a new thing which has happened in the departments of anthropology? Or was anthropology always like that? This is an important question and it has its bearing on what is the relevance of anthropology in contemporary time? Why should one study, study anthropology? Well, if I look into the history of anthropology and I will not go into the nuances and the details, I find that anthropology certainly was not like this. The anthropologists in the past, in the formative era, when anthropology as a discipline came into existence, they were contributing, number one, to a comparative understanding of different societies. This is number one. Number two, they were writing a lot for wider public. I will not use the word lay public. I use the word, you know, enlightened public, those who read, those who understand, they were participating a lot in the national, national debate. They were contributing to, to the understanding of areas which were beyond or above or behind their specialization. They were contributing to this. And thus, 
I would venture on to say that this cocooning, this inward gazing, which actually has its implications for the relevance of anthropology, is some kind of a recent, a new phenomenon, and why this has happened is something I would like to share, share with you. Why the fourth thing will come to your mind when you visit the anthropology department? You will find that in their seminar, hardly people from other disciplines come. You will find they are also not interested in having a conversation with other disciplines. You will also find that they are not generally contributing to those periodicals or those journal which have a representation of different social sciences. I do not think that many anthropologists contribute to economic and political political weekly. You know, for my own department, of course, of course, someone uh, uh, who is now teaching medical anthropology has made a contribution. Otherwise, most of the anthropologists generally publish in anthropology journals. And they want to have an interaction with those of their own species. And this is something which is really, really enigmatic. There is a folk image of anthropologists. And the folk image of anthropologists comprises the following three aspects. If you ask anyone, anyone who is from the university and who has heard of this discipline, I'm not talking of the people who would a little be surprised when you tell them that you are doing anthropology and they would look at you with the wins on their faces. What is it we do not know? But those who have some idea, the first image of an anthropologist is one who is an evolutionist. That's the first one. One who is largely concerned with how human societies have evolved, how human beings have evolved, the past culture, generally the idea of an evolutionist. One is not wrong because when R. R. Merritt wrote an introductory book on anthropology, he says, what is cardinal to anthropology, what is basic to anthropology is Darwinian evolutionism. So it is something which is, which is basic. That's the first thing. First thing that anthropologists are, are evolutionists. That is why they go and dig up uh, places. That is why they work on fossil finds. They are paleontologists. That is why they look at, uh, at uh, how things have evolved. Number two, the second is anthropologists are largely concerned with those societies which are marginal. Societies which are outside. The the pale of modernization. Societies which are, which are of people who are going to be transformed very soon. They wouldn't remain what they are. People who are hunters, food gatherers, people who are pastoralists, people who are shifting cultivators, and those who are bound to change over a, over a period of time. This is the second second image. Number three, that this subject has a very limited relevance. It only tells us, it only tells us about these people. And if you start counting, then perhaps uh, today, today's word, in so far as my reading goes, doesn't have more than 130 or so hunting and food gathering society, not more than 30,000 people or, or so. And if you take up, say, for example, the anthropology is being interested in the study of tribal communities, say in India, so there are 8% people or 8.2% people who belong to these categories, and they are, some of them have changed a great deal, some of them have not. And so it's a very small kind of a of a society or a section of society with which you are concerned. So you are a specialist on a very small kind of a society and how far your understanding, how far your understanding can be extended, how far this can be extended to understand humanity at large. 
need to further point that how far well well we are we are all right to the time we are learning about these small societies but what about human society as a whole how far are we able to understand it so it has a limited use limited applicability and therefore it should remain an esoteric subject esoteric subject and should not be there's no need for you to teach teach it because when tomorrow oh, there will not be the so called primitive people anthropology also will come to an end as a footnote i am heading i am adding here that when r k mukherjee is spoke to a student a very very famous sociologist when mukherjee spoke to a student who had come from north africa north africa he said the following it is written by by mukherjee he said that till the time we are tribal under code till the time we are primitive these anthropologists come and study us but when we will become literate when we will have state when we will not be hunters and food gatherers when we will be in government job when we will be educated then we will be studied by sociologists and political scientists political scientists so these anthropologists it's a very evocative uh, evocative statement it tells a lot about uh, about the perception the folk image of the of the anthropology and also it tells us about that that the relevance of anthropology has to be viewed in this in this respect now now this three images which are which are are there it is hardly of any any relevance then we contrast a uh, uh, a picture which is very different from what i have tried to present in terms of cocooning in terms of inward gazing look at the disciplines of history disciplines with which i am having little familiarity look at the discipline of economics look at the discipline of linguistics psychology and also also <coughs> philosophy look at other social sciences and you find that anthropological subject matter and i would underline this statement has been appropriated by them historians carry out field studies economists have become skeptical of the laws of market economy and they realize that there are other factors which affected if everything goes according to the market economy and the laws then economics will be a true science and you find other kinds of motivations and factors which come perito called them sentiments you know which affect the the economic behavior come to linguists i am greatly interested in this discipline where a large number of linguists are working on on conversation how actual conversations are conducted look at the concept of culture which has become very prominent in psychology having a discipline called cultural psychology and you find that that all these disciplines you know are referring to the writings of the anthropologists some of the writers of the formative and constructive era of anthropology are being reread james fraser is one of them edward tyler is is another one and of course there are a large number of admirers of of the american anthropologist clifford gears the french anthropologist claude levi strauss and the british anthropologist edward lee and of course not to forget Indian anthropologists Professor M S Srinivas and Professor Andre Bethe now they are referred to in other discipline and their idea their approaches are definitely definitely you know determining conditioning 
the course of thinking in these, these disciplines. Now, since the anthropologists are suffering from the poverty of the department, they are suffering from the poverty of human power. Not many anthropologists are there. Actually, the largest number of anthropologists are in the United States of America, followed by Japan. And then comes China. Then comes China. India is further down. The maximum number of anthropologists in Japan are concerned with what is called documentation. The Japanese have this encyclopedic approach and they are great contributors to what is known as, it's a good word, uh, sometimes you can debate it also, what is known as salvage anthropology, which means the cultures are dying out, the practices are coming to an end, and lest it were to happen, the things just change, they must be recorded, they must be written down. Look at the Japanese journals of ethnology, they prefer the term ethnology, and they are full, full with with incredible detail, with the nuances of the of the the, 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 the cultural practices and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, norms and values of these society. So we are further down, but then we find how anthropology has influenced the other discipline. If you read very closely the papers like sociology of development or the papers which deal with change and progress, you find that at one time we sang the PNs of Western model of development, which was regarded as the first model. And sometimes we contrasted, this was just 20 or 30 years ago, with the Japanese model of development. Today, today, West itself is doubtful of its own model. West is not imposing that kind of a model with the same vigor as it did earlier. There is some kind of a notion which is coming up, coming up all over is that, that we can learn a lot and this will be the starting point of looking at this aspect of relevance. We can learn a lot from the way the so-called primitive societies live, the way primitive people live. One of the finest contributions of anthropology, and I'm very, very proud to be an anthropologist, and very proud to be a part of this tradition is, the contribution of anthropology is in terms of what's called ethnography. Many people don't know what ethnography is, by ethnography, it's a footnote here, by ethnography I understand, or we understand, a process of understanding a culture as intimately as possible. This is the first meaning of the term ethnography. The second meaning of the term ethnography is, it is a piece of writing on a culture which is different from the culture of the investigator. Or it may be the culture of the investigator, but that culture of the investigator has been studied following the method of defamiliarization. Now, I have said many things in this dense statement. Ethnographic account is, is an account of a particular culture, particular people particular people, the way they live, the way they, they procure their livelihood, what is the meaning they give to their lives, how they marry, how they, they dispose of their debt, how they actually live, the slice of their life, and of course the slice of their life, I provide an account, a detailed account. Clifford Gears called it, many of you are familiar with this term, a thick description, a thick, detailed, nuanced description of that culture. And it is written so vividly that you are transported to that. You feel when you are reading an ethnographic account as if you are in the 
gardens of these primitive people as if you are attending their ceremony and that is why I will add here that for being a good social anthropologist you need to have a good command over language. Anyone who wants to be a good social anthropologist has to have the literary flavor and that was the reason that many of these anthropologists went to the extent of saying that anthropology besides being other things is also a literary enterprise how to write up, how to write up the, the, the literature. This is something which is, which is basic. Now, I said it is an account on the people which I have studied or the investigator has studied or the anthropologist had, has studied the people. The people can be the other culture, but they can be one's own culture also. Today, one of the remarkable changes which has occurred in anthropology is that we are conducting studies on our own cultures. We are going back to our own villages, we are going back to our own communities for study. And this has given rise to what is called native anthropology, what is also called autoethnography. Auto means self, ethnography means a kind of writing self-writing on the self rather than the self-writing on the other. This is a very, very strong tradition which has come up and there are many people who are, who are protagonists of this idea, Srinivas being one of them, T.N. Man being the other one and there are so many people who are saying that one, there is no harm in studying one's own society provided we follow the tools of defamiliarization and defamiliarization means that I Keep aside my familiarity with my people. I approach my people with the same frame of mind as I approach the, the other, other culture. This has been a tremendous contribution. In our discipline we say that every anthropologist should produce at least one ethnography. We sometimes call it monograph. And once you have done an ethnography, and once it is published, it is almost like the sacred thread ceremony that you have now become a part of the discipline. You may write hundreds of books on theory. You may write hundreds of articles, you know, on library material. But unless you have carried out field work, unless you have written an account of your own people or the people you have studied, you are not classified as an anthropologist. Incidentally, I can tell you that when you go for your for your interview, they would ask you, invariably they would ask you, do you have any monograph to your credit? And then you to take out count one. We are also told that after you have done your doctoral dissertation, do not publish it in the form of articles. You should publish it in the form of a monograph. It should be published as, as a whole and it should be published as quickly as possible lest the entire material becomes cold and stained. So publish it as soon as possible. I can, I can share with you the anxiety of the doctoral student. Once they have submitted their thesis, they want to de-thesis their thesis and convert it into a book. This is what, what, what we do and this is an immense contribution which the anthropologists have, have, have made. And this contribution is about people who are very different from us. And when I say us, we have in mind the, the, the Western societies or people from the, the, uh, the great tradition, people who are rich from the affluent part of the world. When they read about, say for example, what goes on in a village, what goes in a, in a community, they come to know the alternative ways of living. Anthropology today, if at all it is of any relevance to other disciplines, it is in terms of providing alternatives to human existence. What are the various ways? Is this the only way? Is this the only way in which we should live or we are advised to live. Are not there other ways of living? 
are not there the alternative ways. Anthropology, anthropology attacks number one ethnocentrism. This is number one. You become more and more humble. You become more and more tolerant. You become more and more pluralistic in your approach. And here, I would like to add something you know, which will substantiate this point partly. And certainly, I am not saying that it can't happen in other disciplines. This is not my idea. You see, there is a very famous statement. Once again, the students of anthropology know it by heart. It's a statement from the work of Eric Wolf, which is, anthropology is the most scientific discipline among the humanities, and it is the most humanistic discipline among the sciences. It's a very, very famous statement, that it is a science among the humanities, and it is humanities among the, among the sciences, looking at the aspect of, of human. 